we were thinking we'll just sit on stage because we don't want to be a, too far away from you. Hello, hello. Oh, this, all of this is fine. Um, it's very nice that you guys are here. Oh, there's still acro yoga happening. Some are very, they, they can't stop. They're, we were looking at that earlier. That looked really impressive. <laughs> oh, sorry. So they're going back to the sofa for us. Thank you. So it's a bit static here. Feels a bit um, like we're being pushed onto the sofa, but then it has to be like that. Oh, oh it's my turn. I have to do all of this. Okay. Um, so we're part of the Thousand Gestalten Collective, and we were invited to talk about the thing that we did for the G20 Summit in Hamburg last year. We don't know whether you all remember what happened there. Um, parts of what happened in Hamburg you probably remember, but we don't know whether you remember what we did specifically. So we would like you to show you a movie that kind of does a sum summarizes what happened. It's a 10-minute movie. That's basically how we put into scene this entire uh, this entire project. And we hope you'll enjoy this for now, and then we'll tell you more about this topic. Um, so they're showing the movie now, and we'll uh, do our best to kind of summarize and or like translate whatever is being said. Um, but since it's basically a movie and there's obviously visual input, yeah, there's going to be a limited amount of things we can do. So you could translate the name of the collective and um, this one project that they did as 1,000 shapes, with shapes referring to uh, potentially individuals.
Well, we'll spare you the one minute credit, one minute's worth of credits. So, what happened there? What, what, what was going on? You were also supposed to say something about the media response. Ah, well, we wanted to start by showing you what could you see during the whole thing that was in Hamburg on the streets. After that, there were two days worth of press, rep like media reports. Um, internationally, we were on the um, uh, front pages of all international newspapers. We were millions looked at our stuff. Um, we were in the Tagesschau, the German national news, um, on primetime television. That's maybe what you saw from the outside of this whole thing. Those are so, these are some of the headlines. Um, um, and we were able to kind of like set our marker down two days before the summit. We'll say a, a bit more later about how that happened, why it worked, and which strategy we maybe used. But yeah, so I think for starters, like, well, what happened in the first place? What was the chronology of this whole performance? We have to say that we didn't exist in the beginning of last year. As a collective, we didn't exist. We were created ourselves. We found each other for this action. We had five months time to put everything into place. And it started, I think a lot of you can understand that. In the beginning of last year, we all were in a kind of shock, right? We were completely petrified and couldn't, were, uh, couldn't move. Um, in, in, in sight of all the stuff that was happening, um, Trump, Brexit, Europe moving to the right, the AFD getting stronger and stronger in Germany. So for us personally and in our networks around us, in our circles of friends, in our bigger circles, we realized that there was this pressure. We need to do something. We need to go out. We need to position ourselves. We need to be clear on what we believe. It's not sufficient for us to stay in our own subcultural bubbles and have our opinion there, but we have an opinion and we should go out and we should use our own networks to go out and take a clear position on all these issues. Simultaneously, the G20 summit was also um, about to happen just outside our front door in Hamburg. So we were invited to Gängefittel, a quarter in Hamburg. Um, there was a networking um, event with the um, hedonists and a bunch of like activists and collectives that all existed already and that had much more experience than us were all invited, um, that had been doing political protests for years. We went there and we exchanged ideas and we were wondering, well, what do we want to do? What are, what's an action that we could do that we can stand behind and that we can also mobilize our networks for? And in the very beginning, it was obvious to us, if we do something, there are certain parameters that we all agreed on pretty early on. We wanted something that was different, um, that did something different than all the stuff that already existed and that are very important, but that were in many cases very confrontational and very much like based in this like vein of realpolitik in terms of protest. We wanted to do something that reaches other people and that um, reaches out to people to bring them in and implement them. So how can we kind of like uh, get the grandma from Winterhude in the German countryside to go out onto the streets with us, like the family, like the middle class family from Hamburg that was otherwise supposed to leave the city? Because you may have heard that the media were talking about how dangerous it was going to be to stay in Hamburg during the summit and a lot of people had already booked their holidays and we were like, how amazing would it be if we used our networks and many other people that we never dealt with before and that we never worked with before and who'd never protested before um, to kind of reclaim that city for ourselves to really, we could already see these empty streets um, completely, a city complete, completely on lockdown, the 20 most like the 20 biggest econ economies um, discussing the future of the world in complete isolation and everyone, especially civil society, just has to watch and everyone is everyone being scared of taking a stance. And so that was an important aim, right? We wanted to provide a platform to have a very simple but clear stance. Third, we wanted it to be um, something that was easy to remember, that would stick in people's heads, because with this whole media circus that was going to be going on, we already knew what, what that, 
what would be happening. Usually anything that happens was going to be instrumentalized for one side or the other. So we wanted to have something that would work in opposition to that, right? So for one, we wanted to appear in the media. And secondly, we wanted to be in charge of what they would be saying about us. So those were our goals that we could all identify with. And we took these goals and kind of like went back into our own small circles. Well, we are from Berlin. And we had kind of like small cultural circles of people that work a lot in like festivals and like cultural issues. Um, we also have a small cultural association called um, Next to the Lake. Um, and so we took this idea and our motivation that we had back into these small circles. Um, and then we had a bigger meeting in February with 30 people. Um, and you can see that on a photo that Johannes is showing right now. And from the very beginning, it was great. The feedback was amazing, and there was a lot of energy behind everything. A lot of people were extremely motivated to put something into place and to implement something. And so that's when we founded a collective for this thing, because it was also very clear to us that we didn't want to be a group that put individuals in, in front. But it was important for us to be a group that we did this together and that we also communicated that way. So it's not about individuals being at the forefront, but the group as a whole. From the very beginning, we determined what do we need. It was very clear we wanted something, like putting something into place with 1,000 people would cost us at least 30,000 euros. Um, something of this size with the attention that would be there for the G20 summit with this general political situation of isolation or lockdown in, in the city, it needs in, we needs to have a permit from um, official places, otherwise it's going to be shut down after a minute. So we needed to work with the um, with the official bureaucracy. And so those were all these big things. It needs to be legal, it needs to be permitted. It's not supposed to be like an illegal protest. So those were the biggest hurdles that we faced. And then we started walking. We can talk about that a bit more later on, how all of these things happened one after another. But so these were kind of like the starting points that we had um, in early February. You just saw the outcome and the end. And so the way that worked out is, of course, that we were all super happy and we're all hugging each other um, because everything went well. Just before the whole thing happened, it wasn't clear whether we would get all the money together that we needed and whether we the city would actually permit us like allow us to have to do this and give us like a place to do it. So all of this just kind of like everything just came together in the week before. We had a logistical center in Oberhafen in Hamburg. We had friends there who were supporting us, who gave us um, halls and who helped us with logistics to there. And we'll just show you a few videos of what that area looked like just before the whole thing happened. Um, um, if it works. So the movie they're showing right now, yeah. So I, w w what, I, what I think this is about is getting rid of your shackles um, and showing that people are diverse and are a rainbow and a mul multiplicity of colors. I can see like crusty old society that just needs renewal and f like freedom and, and, and needs to get rid of these old thick layer of crustiness. I, I mean, uh, bottom line, I decided to join this because I wanted to protest, but at the same time, like, I, I also am afraid of the violence that usually is surrounding political protests, and I didn't, that's why I don't want to be associated with that. 
And that, I, I'm really excited that gray is going to turn into colorful. I think that is my main motivation. Um, I think this is kind of what, for me right now, personally, this is something that really just occupies my mind and my, my everyday life and my working life and where it should go and what I should do in the future and uh, if I want to continue in the hamster wheel or not. I think that really quite fits well with me. Uh, I come from Cuxhaven and I read about this on the newspaper there and um, knew right away that this is the right thing for me. Uh, it's definitely something that is touching a lot, a lot of people and their consciousness, and I think this is where the potential in this lies. I really would just want to express that you're tired and overloaded and overbearing, and in a big group you can free yourself. Yeah, um, I, that was uh, three hours just before the uh, stuff took place when everybody was prepping, and all of these are people that are people that we didn't know before that heard of us uh, by means of social media campaign, by news reports beforehand that accredited themselves through our website, that then got information from us, and then about 1,000 people arrived that morning uh, at Oberhafen and took part in this, that trusted us, that by our communication, got the feeling that this is something that they want to join, and I can just put myself into their hands and join them. And that was something that was, even though we were hoping that that was how it was going to take place, it really surprised us that we got so much trust from all those people. And I think the big question, of course, is how do you manage to do that? How does that work? And um, what are the measurements that need to be taken? What paths do you have to go to get there? And we kind of want to try to recap this so that you get an idea what you potentially can do for your events, for things that you're planning to do, what you're aiming to do, so that you can use. Um, so that's kind of the reason why we got invited, so that you take something from this. I think one of the main reasons was that we tried to find something that's inclusive, something that tries to reach everyone that's communicating. We're all sitting in the same boat. Uh, we're all on the same side. We have to solve these problems together, and we have a communicative problem, and that's something between you and me, and not b bottom and, and up. And it it's, wasn't about concrete political phrases. Um, it was really about creating a common feeling, a common feeling of we can do this if we change our attitudes and our and I think that was something that the simple, clear message was what really got people into it. Um, I think something that was very decisive was also the campaign that we, from the beginning, from the collective time where we started with 30 people, and that was very, like the, the most important thing was the social media or the, the social media campaign that we were doing. Uh, that was what marked it um, in large parts and concepted it. and. And he, with a lot of helping hands, he, he pushed that through. Uh, why don't you tell us about the website and how that started and what the strategy behind that was? Yeah, sure. Um, the idea was, I can, I, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly talk about, about the energy that, that was there from the beginning and what happened. Like this collective really founded upon this. Like in March, we got invited uh, by Gudrun and Johannes and two, three other people. And there was 30 people there and there was this energy that within three months we, we made this happen. And from the beginning we had the problem, we only have three more months left. That was not a lot of time and we don't have an environment where we are a collective that's established, that has done five events, that's got lots of established channels. If they post something, a thousand of people will show up. Um, so because of that we uh, aimed, tried to s come up with a campaign that uses the capacities that we have, us and our channels and us as a, as, a, as, a, as a measure of speaking. We try to reach a critical mass to start something that would then reach outside of our bubble and that we would overstep our circles. And we didn't just want to be loud and I, my friend and my three followers on Twitter. We wanted something that would resonate and would feel that that's something that you would want to join and to use us as a group as a, at the same time. So we developed this strategy that then 
was on point, went online on one day. Everybody that was part of the collective at this stage did a little bit, got a little bit of instructions via email, went kind of like, the, okay, these are the main channels for the homepage. We wanted people to get to the homepage because the homepage had all the information, the two most buttons to register and to donate. Those, are, those were our two main goals. We wanted to get them to this homepage. And in order to do that, we used um, tools to reach the people, and we were like thinking, what channels do we want to use? Which can we use? Which morally are we not capable to use? Which ones do we have to use to reach people? So we uh, created a Facebook event, a Facebook fan page. Uh, in Germany, we have 32 active, like million active Facebook users, so that's kind of why we settled for Facebook. Um, we additionally, uh, created a Twitter account that was kind of more in the peripheries. It wasn't as important. And um, then we started, uh, I think in the beginning of April is when the website launched. It was programmed specifically for this. There was a front end so you could go to the website and you could see the collective. We wanted to show who are the faces behind this as a collective. So how do we get people to trust us? Oh, there you can that you can see the the collective's page. We had the names. Uh, why do we want to join? And uh, we had like this kind of central point. Like this Facebook event was another central organizing tool. So we had other things like as a profile filter that then had a like little social media gimmicks. Um, or to switch to marketing speak. Uh, you can talk about CI in an activist kind of sense, and p to be honest, like even in that field, uh, something that you should put think like thoughts into, it's worth it. And we really, really just uh, it was an orchestrated thing. We started mid-April, about 100 people at the same time uh, joined the event on Facebook. We had uh, texts that were pre-written. We had. Uh, recruiting video where we, because uh, we didn't really have any video material previously. So we had images that we used from other mass performances in order to give people an idea. And all of that together was the trigger to build this critical mass that was needed, that was beyond our bubble. Uh, Mark, you, you always talk about the critical mass. And I asked you back then, what is a critical mass, like what's the number to build a critical mass? And that was a quite low yeah. number. Yeah, it's it's honestly like all you, you with us, <coughs> was about 100. Um, and if you take it very closely, it was only five. It was only the five of you that then got the 30 people and then six weeks beforehand. Like a critical mass can be super small. It doesn't need to be big. So um, when does this start to be like this kind of self-firing engine? Uh, how does that multiply by itself? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, well, yeah, that was, there's different uh, responses to that. For us, our path was we hacked media, basically. We, uh, by creating this presence in the social media and on the internet, we created this presence that classic media had to kind of pick up and report on us. And and that is, I think, our recruiting phase of uh, performers and supporters was about 10, 11 weeks. And in the first seven weeks, there was about 30% who registered. And then I think after that, they obviously would like go into the Facebook event, follow the f Twitter account, we're talking about it, and we're kind of broadcasting the messages within their networks. And that was kind of when public broadcasters all of a sudden were starting to report on us. And I think that really had an impact. And then ARD, which is German first channel on the BBC, comparable to the BBC One. So that, that's when uh, a lot of people started to get interested. What's interesting was we didn't wait for media to show up. We really actively tried to target that. We had a group that was only dealing with press work and that was publishing press releases. It's like you can't just do press releases, like you can't send them just a press release. Nobody's gonna be interested just because you send them a press release. You have to do a lot more. You have to offer them something uh, in doubt that's usually pictures and stories, and that's why we knew that about a month before this event, we kind of have to be capable to show them 
what we could potentially be showing. So we did a little bit of a pre-event in Hamburg with, um, with, I think, 12 figures. Uh, we, that's when we tried the costumes for the first time, when we tried the, the, uh, the, the structure and the costumes and everything, and we just kind of did this. And then they went through the Mönkebergstrasse, which is a main shopping road in Hamburg on a, uh, on a, so a lot of people were out shopping and in uh, time lapse, people walked through the city and then we invited the press to come to this. And on the left, you can see there's the, there's the photographer from the German uh, press agency and he came for an hour and I think that was our biggest achievement at that time because it, it marked a starting point because these images are then going to be shown, like, are going to be seen by the tiny local newspaper. And if he has, like, a little snippet of a story, that'll then reach the local newspaper. And that's how the, the old lady that you saw in the video before could read about this and then got could register on the website. And that's kind of how we, we started this this spinning wheel and this, this little pre-event, us generating these images that could be used uh, a month before the actual event itself. This was in front of Hamburg City Hall, and people were like wondering, questioning what's going on. We kind of created this story a month prior, and, 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 and they took it and published it, and um, that was super important for us. And, um, and, and that was something that just got the attention span up, and, and, and people were believing in the fact that we could uh, manage to do this. And we, of course, have about a month before creating an event. It's like kind of last minute. But for everyone else, it's kind of the time where this kind of comes into people's mind and their attention. In a big civil society mass that then reads about this in the paper is what literally like it comes closer and is then faced with what am I going to do for a G20? Like, I, don't, I do want to kind of take a stand, but I haven't yet found a way of what I want to do. So for press mobilizing, that was super important. Everybody was kind of yearning for images. Everybody was already writing about G20 and what was going to happen. But secondly, to mobilize people, uh, because people in the street, we could get people from Hamburg and capture those and get those to get involved. It was super, like, it was a proof for us how people would respond to this, like this image, like how how is that going to work? So we had these kind of bubbles of people like cropping together, in, like taking pictures, sharing it on their social media. So that was a way of testing this. And what was really important, from the beginning, we had a journalist that was part of the team from uh, the NDR, which is the Northern um, Public Broadcasting in Hamburg. Uh, so she kind of followed us. It was a bit of a home story. She, he was doing this me at the G20, and she was taking part in the... In the, in the art protest, and, and that basically um, made sure that we would be featured on the, on the TV uh, from the beginning on. And because we wanted to reach the locals, the Hamburg locals, that we can't reach via our networks and bubbles. That's how we, need ma that's how we needed mass media. And that really helped with getting approval for this whole event, because a week before the event took place, police told us we cannot permit you to do this. For two months, we were negotiating details of this, and then they were like, oh, well, we can't do anything for you guys. We need a political sign. And, and by, by doing uh, this, by having had built this uh, relationship with the press, we could kind of um, generate uh, an political pressure because then the Senate all of a sudden could be like, oh, but we're like supporting integrate like these kind of protests and we want we want to enable that and they they couldn't um, they couldn't not approve at that stage. That was a really positive outcome from mobilizing all this press beforehand. We could actually generate pressure and get this political approval and then the police had to permit us to do the do the protest because uh, that was not something that was a given. And now we haven't uh, talked about uh, this mass performance, this type of art performance, and these images are obviously the, the most concise outcome, but maybe you kind of uh, talk about this a bit more. Uh, yeah, we, we as a collective, we always understood us as a collective, not as a group, where some make a decision and everybody else does what they do. We just kind of try to come up with a collective process of making decisions. Well, of course, you can't make decisions and rehearse with a thousand people and, and work up something with a thousand people, everybody contributing like this. So we kind of uh, made sure that we would have 
20 head performers. We searched for those that would then also kind of guide other performers. And so with those, we rehearsed and improvised this and uh, the different steps of the, the, the freeing of uh, the clay, the finding your senses again, the freeing, of, freeing yourself off the gray costumes. We tried all sorts of stuff and then we just kind of tried, went for like a very straight symbolized version of like um, wiping your eyes and, and getting rid of the clay crust. We had all sorts of images that we tried out and they didn't really work. And so we had 20 people who knew this stuff by heart. And then they each got another 20 people assigned or 25, I think. They would then, oh, I think there was no, there was more. It was about 40 people. So these 20 would then, oh, we had 40 head performers and they each had 20 that they would then follow their head performer, just follow that person. So he's the one who's going to guide you. He's going to show you where to walk. If you just follow his example, you're not going to do anything wrong. I think this is how we could rehearse this quite well without having to rehearse with a thousand people at the same time. Yeah, uh, after the, the event, there were, because there was so much press for the artist's performance, there's this media train that then happened. It was two days prior to G20 and every feature that was then happening, we were mentioned. And it was a n narrative that was inter like integrated and within Hamburg. And it's something that ha it really showed Hamburg as this like peaceful, creative form of protest where uh, people could express their, their, um, their disagreement without having this narrative of something exploding right away and straight away. And and uh, in the international uh, media coverage, we could uh, push the, the the images through the network. So we could kind of ask, like, do you know a, a journalist in Brazil or India? And that is kind of how we then made it uh, all over the global news and, and, and within global social media and forums. And uh, that's where it was then discussed. Yeah, exactly. And and additionally, these images are still being used the other day in the Spiegel. Um, whenever it's to find a symbol or an image for a form of civil societal protest, uh, criticism on capitalism, um, to oh, like these images sort of express something that's viral on a societal scale, it's not really about content that we kind of um, went for. It was more about a critical attitude that you can take and that you are expressing with it. And that was, of course, something that was highly debated. We really debated that how much, how much content and fixed standpoint do we want to take? Like, that was quite a controversial debate. Do you remember that, Mark? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, I remember that quite well. Um, we um, were on a bit of thin ice. Thin ice is maybe the wrong metaphor, but like G20 was in every way, shape, or form an extreme. Uh, what happens there? Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, you want to know what's on the sign? That's the best time <laughs> showing <laughs> that I've ever seen. Zero minutes or 10 minutes? It's zero. We're at zero. I think we're just gonna do. We're just gonna do ten, right? Oh, this it, it said zero. Okay, mm, great, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> now I kind of dropped my line. Political message. Yes, yes. I was talking about the political message, communication, and that stuff. Yeah. All right. So there was this. All right. Then it's quite quickly. Then I can. We had to fulfill so much. We wanted a performance, part of G20 Summit, which was not our playground. The people who were political active in that field are normally from the political extreme spectrum or from a spectrum that have been established for the past 20 years. So we had to kind of, all these people that we respect, but we did something that was not really part of how they would do it. We had to kind of get in line with them. At the same time, we wanted to do something that was happening in G20, in the red zone, 
So we had to go into communication that was a completely different way that is that is conform with legals and legalities of this without pissing off the one or the other side or uh, being blocked by either one of them. Um, so or, or really like just hates us afterwards. So you you it oh so we we did four full days of developing this communication strategy so that we do not hit any brick walls. And there was a lot of brick walls. And somehow we managed to kind of drive around these walls. Yeah, but we also had kind of a very, very um, high expectations for what we wanted to express. So we didn't really try to get the least critical standpoint. We really wanted to get something across that's super important and that's something that we wanted to express now. Like people believe that you as a collective, as a whole group can do something, position yourself in a constructive way, uh, gr form communities and please voice what kind of society you want to live in. And that was our message and it was absolutely beyond real political positioning. We wanted to create a union among so many subcultural com communities and the, with the regular people and that never really ha had encountered us or maybe would not want to encounter us or would not want to get involved with people who protest. And we kind of had to get this overarching message. I hope that you take something from this and um, you can be seen, you can become visible if it works. Um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, coming and thank you so much for the talk. Uh, thank you so much. Something that's really close to our heart is that if you're planning something and you need material or you think that somebody could potentially call us or contact us, it's, we're super interested in sharing our knowledge to motivate people. Um, use, you can use our network and newsletters and we do send out recommendations. Just get in touch with us via our website. Uh, thousandgestalten.de is our website.